Happy Friday, and guess who's back? It's us, Melissa and Bree. I know you missed us. We What's missed up? You. <laughs> I can't believe it. We are back for season four, four of Beyond the Steps. Uh, for those of you who are new to the show, I am Melissa McDaniel Grisham of Turning Point Dance Creations, and I am the co-host of Beyond the Steps with the wonderful, amazing, and beautiful Bree Zabrowski, co-founder of Apollo Performance. Say hi, Bree. What's up, everybody? How's it going? <laughs> happy fall, y'all. I know. We are so happy to be back for season four. If you are a new viewer, we are a weekly podcast, video podcast, um, that goes live at 3.30 every single Friday, 3.30 Eastern time, to talk about issues that face performance athletes, their coaches, their parents, their families around racism, psychology, mindset, lifestyle, nutrition, dance medicine, and science. Um, and we tackle the big issues and answer the questions that everybody wants to ask, but they might be afraid to, or they just don't know where to go. Um, so we have been a resource for this community for four years started this back in 2020 you know when that thing was happening that one thing, um, the, that dreaded thing keyword. The, dreaded, the dreaded word was happening um and you know it has just grown and we are just so absolutely grateful to still be able to serve um this community in this way um and i am excited about season four because we have new guests coming we have some of our returning guests coming um and we are just extremely excited to be back. Speaking of being back, things have changed since we last <laughs> left you. Many things, many what things. What do you mean? Changed. What do you mean, mean? Brie? I think you might want to start because it's pretty. Well, we need to talk about the elephant in this room because <laughs> I clearly am in a different place. Um, we moved. So the family and I over the summer while we are on break, um, we picked up and moved from Michigan, where I grew up and where my family is. So we moved the family to Idaho, where my husband is from and his family is. And so we made a very large move and are staying. Not only did we move and change schools and, you know, all the things, but um, we are building a house and our house is not going to be done until the beginning of December hopefully. And in the meantime, we are staying with my in-laws. And so my office, my workspace is in a little like house office space. I mean, it's, it's comfortable. I'm warm. I'm, I have a coffee machine, which is all I really need. I have a little refrigerator. I have privacy. I have doors, a beautiful uh, view with the outside, but I am in Idaho in the backyard in this little house until December. So Enjoy. It's like the where's Waldo of backgrounds <laughs> <laughs> my office. There are so many right. things to look at. Um, so this is where I'm at. But Idaho, uh, Idaho is the new uh, residency uh, residence right now for the Zabrowski. Oh, yeah. So if you're viewing and you see something cool in the background, just you yeah. know, type it in the comments. Shout it out. Go, and what you. the heck is that? Is that? Like, what is that? Or is that a fill in the blank? That's a new fun game we'll play with yeah. Brady. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> while we wait for her house to be so many things <laughs> like okay so i'll start we'll make this like part of the show while i'm here mm -hmm. but so the first i don't know if you guys can see but it says there's a sign that says if you're waiting for a sign this is it, this is it. huh huh you see how they did that <laughs> so that's your uh your one little uh that is a fun so fact weird. about about the office space today. But anyway, no, we're so pumped. It's been it's been a chaotic couple months for us over here, but um we're we're pumped. We're loving life. We have beautiful views of the mountains and we're loving exploring our new our new home. There's so much to see here in Idaho. It really is gorgeous. So um it's been a lot of fun kind of getting to know our, our new community. But Melissa, what's been up with you? You know, I have not had nearly as many <laughs> life changes. Last year was my life change year. Remember, yes, I, moved got and I got married and all that stuff happened. And, you know, I am very grateful to say that 
I have not had any major life changes this year <laughs> because I needed a year with no major life changes. I yeah. did celebrate a year of being married. Um, so went on an anniversary trip to, thank you, went on an anniversary trip to the Bahamas and had lots of fun there. And I have a teenager who started driving, got his permit and got behind the wheel of our cars. So are you both like training and teaching him or are one of you better at it than the other? Because I have a theory, like our kids are still seven and 10, mm -hmm. but when our kids go to get behind the wheel of the car, I feel like I'm going to have to hand that off to my husband. I don't feel like I'm going to be able to manage that very well. I would like to say that I am better at it okay. than Dan is. However, Dan would probably not say that. Dan is very, or, originally when Gregory got behind the wheel of the car the first time, you know, it wasn't the best. It was, it was, yeah, it was yeah. rough. Yeah. And yeah. immediately that night, Dan is on his phone going, we got to find a junk car for him to drive because he can't drive our car. And I'm like, it's going to get better. Like, you don't have to. <laughs> well, here's the thing too, is like, I am not, some would say, I think I'm a good driver, but some would say that it is not my best, my strongest talent. And so <laughs> I just don't know that I'm the, the most qualified person to be giving the driving advice, but I, you know, I have a little bit of a lead foot sometimes and mm -hmm. have, yeah. I, maybe, maybe it was called crash in my younger years. I don't oh, know, but wow. okay. yeah, so, um, yeah, I don't know that, uh, that's my bag, but yeah. Okay. But yeah. We all have our area. Yeah, you got it. You got to know your strength. You got to know your strength. But he's doing well. Um, and, you know, the studio life is great. We started yeah. our new year um, and getting ready for competition season. So I am very happy to report that I don't have any major life changes. Well, good. I have enough for the both of us. That's just right. fantastic. Exactly. But speaking exactly. of studio life, we... I, I feel like there's an electric energy about this dance season that I'm feeling mm -hmm. that I felt since before the pandemic. I feel mm -hmm. like everybody's just really busy. Everybody's buzzing with excitement about the season. Um, everybody feel it feels like everybody's back. You back, know? right? That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, it's full force, full tilt. I feel like the businesses and and the organizations that survived, uh, you know, that dreaded time mm -hmm. uh, of, of 2020 and, and beyond, um, are are have really figured it out and are now back to thriving. So it, it's really great to hear how excited everybody is about the season, um, and we're excited about the season. So yeah. Melissa, break it down for everybody watching, um, what people can expect from season four. So season four, like I said a little bit earlier, is going to have new guests as well as some of your old favorites. Our, our first two shows out of the gate this season are two guests who were with us back in season two and season one and didn't didn't get to make it with us for season three, but are back for season four. So we're starting out with some with some new uh, some new people for for the season. Um, and we're going to talk about the issues that we are facing for um, this this upcoming dance year. Uh, we're going to break those down a little bit in our conversation today and just really dig into what we think is important to have conversations about. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the studio life, uh, what's happening there, what we see between what parents want, what students want, and what teachers and directors need. We're going to talk a lot about conventions, and we have some good news Convention yeah. and competition, some progress is happening. I like Maybe. to think, you know, the show may have had something to do with that. Maybe. Maybe. Let's 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 just, you know, we're gonna we're gonna put it out there that the show did have something to do with that. That there's some progress being made, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So we don't wanna sit on our laurels. We wanna push forward and really continue to demand some of the changes that we need. And we also wanna talk a lot about um what's happening happening out there as far as accessibility and inclusion for dancers, because that's the next big frontier we need to make sure that we are making dance more accessible. Now that we're making it safer, we need to make sure that everybody can participate. So season four is going to be packed with a lot of the same information with more detail as well as some new topics as well. So very excited about that. Yeah. So as Melissa said, we're talking today about the climate of the dance industry. And 
the trends we're going to explore with our guests this season. But this is completely subjective. And the things mm -hmm. we're seeing from different perspectives uh, with us having boots on the ground, uh, you know, a boots on the ground view, so to speak, uh, from our different uh, areas, you know, me with Apollo and then Melissa in the studio every day, um, but also common themes we're finding in all of the dance educator networks and social media and podcasts, etc. So lots to explore today and throughout the season. And of course, if you have a topic that you Ooh. want us to dive into more, you can always email us info at apollaperformance.com or DM mm -hmm. us on any of our social platforms uh, at Apollo Performance or uh, turning point dance creations. And we, we want to hear from you. We want this show to be, uh, things that are helping you and that are guiding you throughout the season or giving you even just something to think about as you plan ahead and plan for the next thing. Cause that's what we're doing in studios, right? We're always planning ahead and, and on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no break. So, um, I, I, while I can say, I hope you all got some rest over the summer. I know no, that you did we're still pounding it out. I hope you took moments of rest and uh, rejuvenation and got ready for, for an exciting new season. I know we did. Um, and uh, so with that, let's let's go to the first topic. I'm really excited about this. So competitions and conventions, um, that's been a big focus of our show the last three seasons. And I know it's going to continue to be. These organizations have such an impact on um, the industry as a whole. And, and kind of our, I, I want to say, are setting the trends for what happens in the studio. Right. Right? Um, but what's really great, where I think that, and I still think there's, there are some uh, not great practices being made out there in the competition convention circuit. I do want to take a moment and acknowledge some of the, the wins that we've seen in the competition mm -hmm. convention circuit. And I feel like things are slowly shifting there, um, as we said earlier. But the one thing that I'm has been brought to my attention on the Apollo side is the amount of competitions. There, there are a couple competitions out there, and I'm going to call them out because I think it's important that you know um, Revel and Decadance mm -hmm. are both uh, turning their attention to flooring mm -hmm. and um, bringing in sprung Marley flooring or sprung flooring for their convention events, which is wow. huge because right. if you think about it, and obviously, you know, I'm not sure, disclaimer, I'm not sure it, how much of the floor is going to be covered with this flooring, mm -hmm. um, but I know that that is absolutely happening. Um, they're partnering with companies like Omara and others to make sure that these floors are um, laid down at the con uh, convention level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's in the competition level, actually. But um, I think it's important because, and, and one of the reasons we created Apollo Socks, dancers and and other other performance athletes, when you're when you're doing your thing on a concrete floor, I don't care if it's carpet over concrete or concrete, the damage that's happening to the body from that repetitive motion and that repetitive strain over and over and over and landing on something that has no give, that's going to hurt. That's why we feel sore after the convention weekends. And, you know, our dancers aren't dancing necessarily any more than they, I mean, they're dancing a little bit more than they usually right. do. But when you think about the biggest variable there, it's the surface that they're dancing on, mm -hmm. right? And they're on concrete. And so, you know, that's why we create, that's one of the reasons why we created Apollo. And we know that those help immensely, but another fantastic tool will be having sprung mm -hmm. supportive flooring surfaces. Mm -hmm. So- uh, kudos mm -hmm. to those competitions and yep. others that are exploring that. I know that's um, that's an extra expense that those organizations are adding to to sure. their bottom line. Um, and I know that's not that can't be easy as a business, but I, I applaud those people for putting the dancer before the yeah. dance. So and I wanted to um, say this real quick, Brie, because uh, you kind of you kind of led right into it. That's an added expense that they are taking on as a business, which means that you may actually see an added expense on your end as a parent or a studio owner or a director. Right, right. And when you are comparing, you know, less money versus a little more money, you also have to consider the safety factor there. So yes, it might be cheaper for you to go to a convention or a competition that doesn't have that feature, but what's the cost of that to the body um, and the health and safety of the dancer? So it may be, you know, it may be something to consider to pay a little bit more for, for that safety feature. 
Well, and that's such a great point because I, I know that I've seen a lot of conversations about fees going up in general. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're in a very strange economic time. There's right. been a lot of stress on the economy, a lot of stress on American families, mm -hmm. and um, the the costs are just going up everywhere. I mean, I'm ex we're experiencing that on the Apollo mm -hmm. side with like the cost of our yarns, the cost of shipping, the cost of fulfillment, the cost of everything has gone up. And, and I feel like everybody's feeling that. And I think what's frustrating as a consumer is when you see the prices going up, but there's no value added. Yeah, right. Right? It's hard to spot the value added. And so as a consumer, um, it, it and I know parents don't always get that choice because a lot of times the decision is made by the studio owner. But I think it's really important that we're able to differentiate when, you know, when we see that value, we're like, OK, that's worth the extra five dollars right. for routine right. or, or whatever it is. Right. Um, so. So, again, as Melissa just said, and reinforcing that, just think about that um, and, and find out what that value added is. You might be surprised. Mm -hmm. um, we're also seeing um, more mental health education all all around at yeah. conventions, which is super cool. Um, I don't know if y'all are aware, and we're going to have, um, they're actually, Apollo's partnering with them this year, but um, we'll have a couple guests from this this organization on, but Embody Dance Competition yeah. is actually, um, uh, they're, they're putting mental health classes um, and education along with movement-based classes throughout the entire convention experience. So it's definitely, um, that that's a new concept, I think, in the convention world that's really taking off. I know they're growing a ton. Um, so shout out to our friends at Embody and yeah. uh, check them out if you have not already. Uh, our, our good friend, Ashley Mowry, who's been Mowry, with us yes. since season one, is now on faculty there. Um, and uh, I just talked to the, the director of the convention and, and they're they're really doing exciting things. So we're, we're excited to see what they do this season. And anybody that attends these things, let us know how you enjoyed them. We'd love to, to hear from you. And you can always DM us or email us info at apollaperformance.com. Um, speaking of scheduling, do you feel, and this is a great question for you and what you saw last season, do you feel you're seeing more balanced scheduling all around at competitions conventions or do you still, do you still feel like you're seeing the same amount of classes that are really wearing these kids down? I know that was a problem, mm -hmm. you know, fatigue at conventions just because they were dancing for so many hours between auditions and competition hours and then the classes, like wh what are you seeing? Cause I'm not in that space as much anymore. You know, I have not seen just judging from ending last season into yeah. getting into this season. I am not seeing those schedules get much better. Um, okay. It's promising that, you know, there's safety measures being put in, but you still, there's, there's not enough safety measures in the world to make up for overuse. Um, yeah. And you have to, I'm hoping to see as we start to register for competitions, and I'll touch on that in just a second, but as we start to register for competitions, that there is more of a balance of, hey, we're not going to be starting at six and ending at 12 yeah. every day. Um, yeah. You know, we're going, we're going, we're going to, we're going to work on that. Uh, what I, I I'm not going to say I'm, I'm cause I want to be hopeful. I'm not going to say that I'm not hopeful, but what I am seeing is that there's nationals for next summer already sold out dude i know so that was one of the things i was going to bring up so that is also a trend that i'm seeing is like i i think back in august i was starting to see competitions and conventions advertise that they were already on the brink of selling out for next summer like 2024 summer yes that is i mean it was getting ridiculous when i was still directing which was like five six years ago now but like it is bad now so I, I'm so curious to know like how everybody is dealing with that and I think that's something I definitely want to explore this season because again I'm I'm I've been fortunate to have the bird's eye view from both sides right mm -hmm. like I've been in the director spot but I'm also uh, leading a business that you have to be cognizant of the dollar. I know that a lot of organizations got burned after COVID with like deposits and ref like all the things. Right. So I get both sides of it, but like, that just seems so extreme to me to have to, as a director, make a decision 
then um where you're going for now and you haven't right. even fully like mapped out you don't out. even know who your team is you don't sure. know i mean and 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 there's an accessibility issue there and it becomes an equity issue because you're shutting smaller studios out to ask a Great studio point. owner of forget small a medium to to moderate size studio to pay a deposit that they haven't collected well, because the parents are also like, at least when the way that we did our program, they were paying their, chore they were still paying on their choreography fees, yes. their, you know, costume Thank deposits, you. all that stuff has to get in, the yes. registration fees, all the things that go with like starting the new season. And then to have to think like, oh, and if they don't, if the parents aren't able to put the deposit down, it's up to the studio owner who they're also managing cash flow during mm -hmm. that time and coming off of probably a slower summer, sure, not right. getting much revenue in and over the summer. So it is just, it's a, it's a crazy dance. So I, okay. I hope that there's a way that we can make that a little more manageable all around so that right. the competitions and conventions have that security, but also so that they can exist and put on a great event, but so also that they're not putting so much stress on the studio owners directly. So right. um, yeah. yeah. I, I, that's, that's something I definitely am looking forward to exploring. Um, uh, and then the other thing, do you feel, I, I feel like there's been a lot of, when we're talking about competitions and conventions, I feel like there's, there have been a lot of organizations that have, there's been a lot that have shut their doors, right. And like mm -hmm. not been able to sustain, which is, you know, hard, but it's, it's also the people that have remained, have built back up kind of stronger and tougher and more, you know, they've been very resilient. Um, and it seems like they're really thriving. And we have a, a little bit more, I think, emphasis on quality at this point. Right. I, I say that loosely because don't come at me because if you've had a horrible experience, I totally validate that. I just, right. I do feel like the pool of, of what remains is is a little bit, uh, the, the quality has gone up. Right. So I, I think the, the quality has gone up and we have to also be very careful to not, I'm going to say monopoly, but not go to these superpowers because back when I, well, no, I would, I would say the tail end of me competing. And then the first, you know, me going into uh, teaching full time, you know, there were, there were monopoly, there were the powerhouses. There were these competition circuits that were, totally. that's it. This, this is what you're doing. And the little ones kind of fell to the wayside and then the little, the smaller ones grew and they made and they made more headway. And now those smaller ones have kind of shed because they couldn't, they couldn't sustain through COVID. And so yeah. I don't want the powerhouse structure again, but I also don't necessarily want this wide range of whatever and whatnot. You show up and you get anything and everything. So yeah. I want to keep the balance there for sure. Yeah, no, that's 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 something to think about too. So do you feel like with these competitions and conventions, and I'm again, my boots are not on this ground right now at this point in my career, but there was there was a lot of solos, duos, trios happening on top of like, I mean, kids in like 17 to 23 Routines. numbers mm -hmm. per competition when they're going fully loaded. Right. So mm -hmm. um, have we seen that go down a little bit? Is there has there been a shift in terms of the number of pieces a kid is in from quantity to quality? There was in COVID, clearly because we didn't have a studio Obviously. space or time to rehearse those things. And there was money issues. And I feel like what has happened is, I noticed last season, is that students were in more solos and duets and less groups. Ah, interesting. Yes. So they were trimming their group participation <laughs> and upping their what we call specialty. So your solos and your duets. So you have a child in three solos, three duet trios, and two large groups. I'm going to be, con I might be a little controversial right now. Here's what I'm going to say about that, where I, I land on this topic. Not that anyone has asked me. I'm just offering. <laughs> I, but that, this is our podcast, so I can right, do that. So we do um, but it's a great, healthy, like, lead into a discussion, right? Is like, I was always on the side and, and I feel like this is really hard for parents to understand because they're like, I'm paying the bill. I'm doing this. I want my, my kid to have this two things as a dancer, whether you go on to be a dancer or not it, as a dancer, 90 per probably higher than that. 90% of your career is going to be dancing as part of a group right. in, in, in your dance career. If that is what your dancer is going to do, your job as a dancer at that point is to make 
the entire production shine and sparkle and look amazing, or if you're dancing for an artist to make that artist look amazing. Look it's not to not stand out above and beyond everybody else. And so when we have a focus on solos, duos, trios, and the me over the us collectively, mm -hmm. I feel like we're doing a disservice to that dancer, but we're also doing a disservice to the art in general. Um, mm -hmm. That's my opinion. And and I, I feel like, you know, um, I, there's, there's lots of ways you could look at that, but that right. was my take on it. So I always limited the amount that those kids could do and they had to participate in X amount of mandatory dances. Now I will say, I do feel like the number of group dances has gotten completely out of control. And, and frankly, from a judge's perspective, and again, y'all weigh in if you disagree with this, but like a lot of things start to look the same after a while, especially when you're seeing it from the same choreographers, the same instructor, like it's the same perspective over and over and over again, just mm -hmm. same movement, same choreography, just in, with a different song right. at a different tempo. Maybe you change up a couple dancers, but like right. when you start seeing that over and over and over again, it to me renders unnecessary. It does render unnecessary. And what happens is your tech that child's technique and technical foundation didn't get any better between number 130 and 135 when they danced exactly. again. And it just it, it it's it's not. And the I believe as a judge and as a teacher that the focus needs to be on less dancing, less choreography and more building that technical base. So if you do five dances, use that time where you were going to do 10, that extra five, and put more technique and technical training into it so that those five dances are stronger. Oh, so, yeah. Dances. Like those five dances, like you should perform those pristine. And then, you know, absolutely do your solo duo. Like, absolutely. But like, do we need to see, you know, three, four solos? Do we need to see, you know, 17 group mm -hmm. dances? No. I mean, there were competitions last year where, you know, I don't know about that. And it was the same number of solos as there were group dances. Yeah. Like there it's, were it's, it's 80 it's solos, it's there were 80 group dances. And I'm like, that doesn't, the it's math not. is not mathing. Why <laughs> are they, and why are we doing two full days of teen solos? It, it's, it's really gotten nuts. Um, I and I'm curious to see what happens too because of the the economic impact of the time that we're in and what's you know what's happening with interest rates and and you know the, the hardship on so many families. I'm curious to see what you know if we see that solo duo trio number come down, are we going to see the team number come down or is it going to just all shift down together or is there going to be no change at all? I'm very curious to see how this impacts. I hope it doesn't. I hope everybody's able to do the things that they really, really want to do that serve them. But um, I'm, I am curious to see if there is a cutback on right. anything this year because right. it's just tough all around. Everything has mm -hmm. just gotten so expensive. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, so we've seen, um, I told y'all the competition convention talk was going to be big. And uh, if you're just joining, this is Beyond the Steps. I'm Bree. This is Melissa. We're back for season four. This is our kind of kickoff episode, our, our homage to season four, mm -hmm. um, to check in with y'all, say hello, let you know what's going on for the season and talk about the trends that we're seeing and the things we're going to be exploring more deeply this season with our guests, mm -hmm. with each other, um, from, the, from our perspectives as business owners, studio directors, but also what we're hearing and seeing um, from our relationships within the industry, but it also in the dance teacher networks and the educator mm -hmm. networks on, on social media. So um, we're seeing a huge amount of uh, Apollo socks are now being sold at more competitions and conventions, which is super cool because I, I didn't realize until we went to dance teacher web, how like we haven't been to a dance show, like a dance trade show with full inventory to sell and all of that in since pre COVID since like dancer Palooza was still around and dance teacher summit. We used to have like hour long, wait, like weights wrapped around like line, just people waiting to try them on and buy them. We haven't seen that since then. And we haven't really been in any dance trade shows for obvious reasons. Shark tank kind of like, we had to catch up to Shark Tank, right? Yeah. And and it took a, a minute. Um, but so this was our first summer that we were at a dance show with full inventory. And we really had no idea how it was going to go. And 
we were back to the hour, hour, yeah. hour and a half wait times, people making appointments to come back and get them and try them on when we were in our off hours because we just didn't have enough time. We sold out of inventory. Like it, it was great. So, so grateful and thankful. But what I realized is people have been waiting to see us again. And so what's cool for everybody out there that has added Apollo socks as a staple into their dance wardrobe, especially on these competition convention weekends when we are on those concrete floors that and our bodies are hurting. Um, people who have gotten turned on to Apollo and understand that they make you feel better, you're going to be able to get them at more competitions and conventions. So we're really excited to see those organizations also getting with that this is a tool that dancers absolutely need and are providing them on these weekends so that's been fun to see um and then you know talk let's talk about the costume companies because a lot of costume companies went bye-bye over the last couple of yes, years they did a really sad um you know, a sad shift but one that I think was a little bit necessary I, I kind of feel like in the dance world there's a lot of uh, you know, lazy giants in the dance world that that have gotten real comfortable at the top yes. of the the top of the perch uh, and, and haven't had to do much right to mm -hmm. haven't had to do much to satisfy uh, the, the 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 majority and i mm -hmm. feel like that is shifting i feel yes. like the consumers are demanding uh, you know more quality better customer service um faster delivery times that's been a huge issue um so do you feel like we're, we're shifting with the people that are remaining are, are doing better about that? Or do you feel like we still need to work on it? I think that they're doing better, way better than the last couple of years. Um, the last couple of years before this this season, you know, we couldn't get costumes at all. We were waiting for costumes, you know, s still the week before competition. Um, well, and it's so one of those things that you had to put the order in, like, right now when you're right. like my brain is not even sure right right exactly yeah. I mean, and even now we're still experiencing but i think that that has a lot to do with just inventory and um okay. and the the cost of things like right now some of the ship dates and some of the uh catalogs that i was looking in last night is is april yeah. and and, and wow. most of them are in december already. yeah already wow. Um, so, you know, I, I do see I do see a, a difference there. The big thing that I would love to see more of because we're having to go to retail sources like the Amazons of the world and the stores for larger sizes yeah. um, costumes. Yeah. because when you look at the sizing charts, the extra, extra large adult doesn't even touch the measurements of the student. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's an accessibility issue. And it's also not necessarily because they, I don't think that the costume companies want to make those sizes. I think that, you know, it's a, it's a production thing. Like, we well, I can it. speak to this directly. I right. can speak to this directly because we have, since we started, had extra small through extra large. Shark Tank put us on a whole nother introduced mm -hmm. us to a whole nother customer with much larger feet. You know, remember mm -hmm. prior to Shark Tank, we were serving the dance community only. Mm -hmm. And now we're serving everyone with feet. And so to have these people that are like, I have a size 15 foot, like I want to wear your stuff and I can't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people asking constantly for different, um, you know, different ranges of skin tone, I can tell you it is absolutely not a lack of wanting to. Mm -hmm. It's um, as a small business, you have to prioritize where, and this is not an excuse. This is just giving people perspective on how things to think about. It's it's not as simple as, okay, well, we need to make these sizes. Right. It's MLQs. It's we're going to, you know, having to invest in the materials to make all of that. And then how, how much is it going to sit there? Um, mm -hmm. Is it going to sell because you're only selling, you know, a handful of these a season, mm -hmm. um, but you have to make X amount, right? So right. It, it, there's just, it, there's a lot to think about. Um, and, and financially, you know, you have to invest in different things to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and and sometimes you have to prioritize. And I, I will say, you know, for us, we're in the same, but we're, we're finally coming out with our wider XXL options. We'll be serving up to a male 15, 16. Mm -hmm. We have those things in the works, but we had to get through, you know, the production bottleneck and yeah. filling back orders and all of those things and getting back to a healthy inventory place before we could release it. And that's taken us almost two years to do. Right. So, um, it, you know, just, just some perspective there. Um, 
but but I definitely agree. I hope we can come up so that we don't have to go to the Amazons. We know we want to support our costume companies, but they also right. have to be able to deliver. They have to be able to deliver on time. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of things that have to happen um, on that. Right. And, and, and in a price point that is not so exorbitant. So, you know, I had to order, I had to custom order a costume for one student and it was triple the price of the costume because it was yeah, custom yeah. ordered. Yeah, and yeah. because they're only making one, I totally get it. Um, so, you know, to your point, it took you two years to get to that point. I would love for costume companies to start thinking now. So two years from now, we're not in this same position. You know, we, you know I think the key, for, the key for the costume company situation, too, is like that's one side of it. But the other side is you have to figure out how to deal with your customer service. You have mm -hmm. to figure out how to communicate because the worst thing you could ever do in a crisis like that is just stop communicating. Mm -hmm. and that, that we learned that lesson. I mean, we were really good about that in our Shark Tank madness. That was like the one priority that we had through all of that is like, we over communicated with our customers to the point that they were like, I, I don't need all right. that. Like, just let me know. <laughs> you don't have to tell me again. <laughs> But because of that, we were able to retain so many of those customers, most of them, because mm -hmm. we over communicated. And I think that's where the costume companies are going wrong mm -hmm. is they're not mm -hmm. putting in that customer service element to let people know, hey, I hear you. We're, this is where your costume is right now. This is where we're going to be. If, if that's not going to work for you and I can't give you an answer right now, let's change your costume. Let's do something mm -hmm. that's more available. Let's do that sooner so they're not freaking out mm -hmm. in you know, in they go silent. They go yeah, really yeah. silent. And then I you wonder have they close their doors. Nobody's answering emails. Nobody's answering the phone. Yeah. Just it, 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 it's frustrating. So there's definitely and problem. as a business, you can't be like, well, you know, we you have to hire the people to do it. There's tons mm -hmm. of like customer service. There's you can't be like, oh well, we don't have the money to do that. Well, you have everybody's money. You so right. you have to figure out how <laughs> you have all of them, them. Right. right? Yeah. So I think that's, that's definitely something that we need to see improvement on, but uh, yeah, the competition and convention world is going to be a big topic in season four. Obviously we have mm -hmm. so much to explore. We want to hear what you guys think. What are you experiencing? What are you seeing um, this season? Let us know, you know, if you go to a big competition convention, what are the things you, you're seeing that you want to talk about a little bit deeper and, and, and get some perspective on? We'd love to be mm -hmm. able to hear that and get a guest that can speak to that. Uh, we do always have our opinions over here. So we'll, okay. we'll be happy we are, to chat with y'all. We're about not it. lacking on opinion. No, we're not. Yeah. We're if not. this is your first time with us, you will find that we are not lacking on opinion. Um, and that, you know, that, that leads me into where I have my biggest opinions, this studio business life. Oh yeah. my gosh. It, let me tell you, yeah, yeah, I'm grateful. It's so much better than it was in COVID. That was so, that was such a stressful time. And it is coming back. Like Bree said, it feels like it's coming back. This is the first season we're full force back the exact, exactly how we were before. Um, and really one of the big things I want to address is, you know, the revenue pinch of things are going up, but in order to remain competitive, you have to main, keep your competitive rates. So one of the things that we have really worked on as a studio is offering non-traditional revenue of value adds to clients. So things like, like bringing a stretch um, therapist on site. Um, and doing free like five minute consultations on different muscle groups and how to get better range of motion. That's a free value add. Um, you know, prices are going up, but these are the things that we're that we're doing. We would love to see more of our studio viewers, owner viewers, using some of the people who are our guests for consultations to come in and do either virtual or on site things with their with their students. Um, one of the things that we did was we set an outside I don't want to I call it class or choreographer um, limit. So, uh, you, know, oh. you know, we said, you know, we are going to we're going to bring outside people in to pay for these classes and workshops. You're not going to spend more than five hundred dollars in the whole year. Is that agreed upon? And we agreed upon it as a team. And the parents said, yes, this is good. So you're not always getting nickel and dime. Like, oh, it's $150 this weekend. Oh, such and such is coming in. It's $200 this week. That's a big deal. Again, that communication element. Mm -hmm. I, I know that's a huge deal for parents. Like most of the time parents will, if it's reasonable and you can explain it. And, and this is where keeping the parents at, at arm's length is, is, is I, I just never 
set, like bought to that. I think mm -hmm. the more you can communicate and give them advance notice about the fees that they're paying, they will find a way. Mm -hmm. They always do. And, and you can work with them on payment plans and things like that. It's the not knowing when the end is coming. Like, how right. much more am I paying? Like, do I have another 500? Do I have another 2000? Like, that's where it gets really, really messy. So mm -hmm. I find like, if you have that preseason meeting at auditions before, so they have a choice before they step into this mess mm -hmm. and they have all the, the fees and all the dates and anything that you can possibly predict at that point, whether it changes a little bit or not, you know, this is when you're going to have rehearsals. This is when you're going to have class. This is when your competition weekends are. This is when you're, this is what mm -hmm. your fees are going to look like and divide it up over 10 months. Like these are, this is your, your payment. Like mm -hmm. they appreciate that. And this is what you're paying for out of pocket. So get ready right. for that too. Right? right. And then, you know, you have those meetings a couple times through the season, you'll find a lot less pushback. It's, right. a, it's a dumping it on them a week or two before that who has that kind of money just laying around anymore, especially in these times. And so I don't. I don't. And that was that was huge. I mean, I felt the appreciation from the parents to say, OK, this is how much I can budget for extra enrichment activities for yeah. my student outside of tuition. So setting that was very, very helpful. Um, and it still allows you to bring people in, but also allows the parents to have some type of um, some type of idea of what's what's going to be going out. So I definitely encourage everyone to watch the show, um, listen to our guests, figure out what they do, contact them and say, hey, can you do this? How much yeah. is this going to this going to be? And add those things that other studios or other people might not be offering that makes you stand out and makes maybe the cost creep a little bit more more bearable there for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, one of the things that came up for me this year, Brian, I don't know if you've if you've heard of this or this was a thing, it probably was when you were when you were still directing, is um like sex abuse insurance. I didn't, I've not heard of that. Yes. So, wow. We, well, we, first of all, where are we at that this is a thing? Like yes. how far have we fallen that this is now like an actual thing yes. that you have, you it's have so to crazy have, to you say. should have. So, you know, we do the, the insurance activity insurance with kids and they offer an additional rider that is not cheap, um, over a thousand dollars a month. Um, for insurance against allegations of sexual abuse. So wait a minute. So what is it, like, what, what do you mean? Like, what does this policy do for a business owner? So the policy covers you if you um, have an accusation of sexual abuse, um, then it covers legal fees. It pays out for um, reputational um uh, like libel and slander if you're found to be not guilty. Okay, um, so this is if you're found to be not guilty, but it doesn't necessarily protect them in a situation where something no, bad is going on. No, so okay. it's accusations, not convictions. Okay. So okay, okay. what, and, and, and the, the way that the person presented it was, you know, there's accusations that we know based on a lot of the shows that we've had, a lot that we've talked about, that, that there are accusations that come out regularly and until you can have your day in court, you're guilty when it comes to this issue until you're proven innocent. Um, a lot of times right, in, the right, public right, eye, right, 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 right. in the public eye, you're tried in the public a lot of times now in the age of social media and, and you know, digital news, you're tried in the public eye before you're actually tried in court. Um, and in that your bit that in that time your business can suffer, your reputation can suffer. And when you work with children, you know, a lot of times, sometimes not, but we can talk about that. Your yeah. business suffers a great deal. And this insurance is there in order to help you during those times and to cover legal fees as you as you as you are trying to move forward. This and it's not just necessarily like you did it, it could be you hired a teacher and something happened or there's an allegation there and i really i wanted to bring it up because to your point where are we that this has happened for sure i mean leave it to insurance companies to figure out how right to, to figure it out but it's such a prevalent situation that we have to do better i feel like in vetting and putting protections in place to make sure that this doesn't happen well, and like, I, I was thinking about this the other day, like, 
I mean, I'm fully transparent on like my, the things that I think I did really well as a director, but also like what I, what I knowing now, what I know now, I, I would have gone back and done it a, a couple things differently. And this is one thing I can say with 100% certainty, I would have not been prepared to no. deal with is if there was an allegation against one of my faculty members mm -hmm. at the studio, like how to go into that crisis mode and deal with that. Like, what is your policy if that happens? Like to right. protect your students, your parents, the rest of your staff, your business reputation, mm -hmm. um, this person who, you know, by all rights is, is not guilty until proven so in court. But mm -hmm. do you dismiss that person until it's resolved? Like what what is the policy, right? Because mm -hmm. there is no governing body. There is no organization to all of this. Um, it is it is up to us to figure it out. And mm -hmm. so um, I, and I just don't I want just somebody wonder. causing harm. You don't want somebody yeah. in your studio causing harm. And you also want to make sure that people who have experienced this type of trauma are validated. And you it's just such a, a an area that we need preparation for. You need the plan. Yeah. You need to know what you're going to do. Um, and I'm not saying I'm not endorsing this type of insurance or anything like right. that. It just brings no. up such a great point of you have to have a plan here and you have to have the protections in place to protect your business, the students, you know, first and foremost, and Absolutely. your business um, and, and and really work through that. So I would love to talk more about that this this season and, and, and have some guests on. To, yeah. To yeah. I uh, it's so it's yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have been prepared. I mean, in full full transparency, yeah. I would not yeah. have been. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not at all. If you are just now joining us, this is Beyond the Steps. I am Melissa and this is Bree. And we are talking about season four and some of the things that we want to see talked about, some of the celebrations that we can have of victories and progress that we're making, and also talk about some places where there still may be voids and uh, we need to do some work within this industry. Um, if you haven't seen season one, season two, or season three, guess what? You can go back and watch all the episodes on YouTube at Apollo Performance or at TP Dance Creations. They are categorized by season. So just start binging, go for it. It's all it's all there for you. Um, season four starts not next week. Well, it does start next week. We're doing a flashback to the week before, but the week after. So uh, make sure you're there for that as well. I want to you know, definitely touch on accessibility, inclusion, and equity, because that's one of our big things as well, Brie. Um, and one thing that I want to call out first and foremost is these costume companies who are making gender inclusive costumes, one of them being 10th so, House. 10th House. OK, so what are you seeing? Oh, my gosh. The costume catalogs. I'm loving it. Fabulous models. Uh, both male presenting and female presenting in all of the costumes. So it's not just the male section where you have the t-shirt and the black pants. Like all of the costumes are being modeled by both male presenting and female presenting, um, male presenting and female presenting um, models. So we want to um, talk a little bit about how um, those costumes are being presented in a way that's gender inclusive and not just female or male section. Yeah. Um, so I want to shout out 10th House. It's a revolution um, company, um, but want to shout out 10th House for um for just uh, taking that step. There may be some others out there. If you know of others that are doing that, please put it in the comments because that's one of the things that we've talked about, gender inclusion and equity. And, you know, we really are happy to see that happening now in the competition world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something that we've talked about now for a couple seasons of just uh, really needing to see improvement. So it's, it's really great to hear. Again, I don't get that much experience with all of this because I'm not on that side of it anymore. Um, but I, I love hearing that that's happening and that you're seeing that more frequently. That's exactly what we need to be seeing at this mm -hmm. point. Um, and, and, you know, we're also going to be exploring the season, um, you know, how, how to better handle neurodivergent dancers, mm -hmm. as well as talking about 
talking about burnout and Mm -hmm. that's still a thing. I would say that's definitely still a thing that has not, we have not figured out as a community yet. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're also going to be talking about that and, and so many other things. Um, Like we said earlier, you know, if you, there is a topic that you want to see this season, you want us to address something or bring on a guest to help shed some, a little bit more perspective from an expert point of view kind of thing, or somebody that's really deeply involved in the industry in that particular topic, let us know, message us info at apollaperformance.com or on our social channels, um, Apollo Performance or TP, uh, TP Dance Creations, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. Got yep. it. See, it took me four seasons. Um, <laughs> But I want to, before we go, because we have to wrap this up, um, new this season, we are doing Flashback Friday episodes every Friday, one or, or one Friday a month, I yeah, should say. I so yeah. One Friday of the month, we're going to go back in the vault um, and pick one of our favorite episodes. It's going to be a surprise. We're not going to tell you from seasons one through three. So we have so much fantastic, helpful content at this this point that just needs to be seen. We need to get more eyeballs on it and you can help us with that. So if you've already watched it, watch it again, share it. Uh, it, it takes many, many times of seeing something for it to really be absorbed into the brain. So if even if you've seen these episodes before or you've watched it, you know, during the actual season, watch it again, please, please, please. I can't stress enough how important this information is. Share it with your fellow parents, colleagues, dancers. This is a show for everybody. And the more that we get this information out there collectively, we can really help bolster our industry and and make sure it keeps moving in a positive direction. Um, It's a great time to get familiar with Beyond the Steps, catch up, or just make sure, again, that that info gets in your head. Uh, We hope you will join us next week, uh, October 27th. And uh, for that Flashback Friday episode, stay tuned for what that topic is and share, share, share. Uh, the platform with you. I'm really excited for everything season four has in store for us. And uh, until next week, y'all continue your journey beyond the steps. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. Season four.